Hey y'all, what's up? It's your boy Evan. Welcome to the Cartoon Block. Today is a very special day. Instead of our normally scheduled drawing tutorial, we have the exclusive interview with an artist who I've admired for quite some time, the one and only Mr. Mark Crilly. Get back here in a few seconds and check it out. I am here, as promised. Here's the man, Mr. Mark Crilly, creator of four comic book manga series, the biggest artist on YouTube with 375,000 subscribers, over 63 million views, plus a husband and a father. Mark, welcome. Thanks for having me, Evan. Well, it's thank a real you for honor taking the time to, to do this, man. Yeah, you know, really I've been looking you, forward man. to it. Yeah, this is great, man. So tell us, how did it all start? How old were you when you first started drawing? What? Take us back. All right, all right. Well, I've always been drawing as long as I can remember. Uh, going back to um, early childhood, I had two older brothers. Always saw them drawing, and they inspired me. And uh, so I was uh, all through elementary school, up through high school. Uh, just working on my craft. Now at that time it was not uh, in the Japanese style. It was more just like in a you know typical American style or the kinds of things kids always draw. Race cars. I remember always drawing that kind of uh -huh. stuff. Uh, and I just never looked back. I kept at it all the way up to college. As a child, what were the things that inspired you the most to draw, and what things did you draw the most of? Yeah, well, you know, we had a lot of comic books in the house. My brothers were big into superheroes. My oldest brother, he was a big fan of The Flash, and uh, we were a DC family, you understand. <laughs> My middle brother, he was a big fan of Batman. Now me, I was sort of a little bit different. I was going off a different path. I was into Mad Magazine. Uh, and so I was really always following that sort of humorous style of cartooning back then. And uh, I would do m these little um, joke comic book strip things that were making fun of Star Wars or whatever it was, you know. I was like the perfect age when Star Wars came <laughs> out, so I would, uh, yeah, I, would, uh, I was always just doing that kind of thing. As I got a little bit older, uh, comedy definitely was something that I was into because I remember Monty Python was something that I jumped into for a while and that was a big influence on me. Monty uh, wasn't for kids, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little bit young to be getting into the Monty Python. Um, now there was a, a more in the realm of fine art there was one artist that impressed me a lot, and that was uh, M.C. Escher, if you've ever seen his work. And from my very youngest years, yeah, I was fascinated with his style of drawing, and I used to do copies and studies of his work. What made you draw more than the other kids? Well, yeah, you know how it is when you are good at drawing, uh, the kids start to gather around and look at what you're doing, and they always say, "Man, you're good." You know what I mean? <laughs> and it starts to fill your, you start to fill your head up. You start to think, "Oh yeah, boy, I'm getting attention," you know. And that's kind of the way. Yeah, I mean, it sort of feeds you uh, your uh, drive to keep doing better and, and going further with it. And, okay. In high school, was there a turning point there that said, "You know, I think." I'm kind of better than everybody else or something. Anything? Well, yeah, you know, I, uh, high school definitely I was advancing in my skills, but when you say the word turning point, I always think of college because that's where I really um, met someone who became my mentor, a guy by the name of David Small. Who, David Small. He's a children's book illustrator uh, and author, and uh, so he kind of took me under his wing and he started uh, showing me uh, uh, how to advance my skills to a high Higher level. He was also that kind of, he gave me that tough love, you know, of the sort of like the coach who does not necessarily always say, oh, you're great. You know, he would say, Mark, this is, you can do better than this, you know. And he gave me that kick in the pants that I needed. Because you can become like a big fish in a small pond in the elementary school years. Like I was saying, everyone telling you you're great which is nice, but that doesn't really help you so much in terms of advancing. You need someone who's going to say, hey, you could do better than this, and I'm going to show you how. What school yeah. did you attend? Kalamazoo College was the name of, uh, of the college I went to. And, um, you know, David was pretty picky about the people that he would choose to focus on, and so I was really fortunate that he gave me that extra attention. What was the next step in furthering your art? Or? Right, well, I, my life took a, a little bit of a, a detour there. I got fascinated with the Far East, and so instead of 
trying to become an illustrator right off the bat, I finished college and I went to teach English in Taiwan and Japan for about five years. At that point, I was drawing absolutely all the time, but I was also, I think, sort of expanding my life and my worldview. I was studying Mandarin Chinese. Uh, eventually, when I got to Japan, I was studying Japanese, uh, you know, trying all these new foods, hearing all these new sounds, these styles of music, and uh, just a golden period in my life of, of, of opening up my mind to, to other new cultures. cultures, exactly. Okay, so from there, after your five years over in the Far East, mm -hmm. You come back to the States. Right, well I'll backtrack just a little bit from there. There was while I was still in Japan that I challenged myself to, uh, to create a comic book story. Now this is in published form now, mm -hmm. but at that time I was just doing uh, pages of artwork, uh, paper, ink, and uh, screen tones. This was uh, my first published work. And I always pull this out when people are asking me, how did you get published? How did you break into the industry? We can talk more about that later. But the first step, I believe, always starts with you doing something on your own without being paid, just realizing your dream. You know, and I, I came up with this story. It was 33 pages long. I just kept at it. That was all while I was in Japan. Then, I, when I came back from Japan, bringing all that artwork with me, that's when I started to do photocopies of it and mail it off to different publishers. Okay, yeah, the submission process. What was the next step? How did you right. get your first you know, publishing right. job? Well, I was lucky. I, I looked at the top um, American comic book publishers okay. and I took the very top ones like DC and Marvel and Image at that time and I said, you know what? they're getting too many submissions they're never going to see my work so I, I didn't bother with those guys I went a little bit down to that second tier of smaller publishers and I thought these guys probably actually open up the envelope hmm. and have a quick look and see if it's something that they can jump on and out of that uh, I found this one publisher named Sirius S-I-R-I-U-S and they were looking at that time for a kind of all ages title which is what this story was mm -hmm. uh, just to backtrack a little because I didn't really explain what the story was it is about a girl who uh, goes into outer space and she uh, is taken off to another planet I describe it as the Wizard of Oz meets Star Wars. So there's a little bit of the, has that sort of classic children's fantasy story mixed together with the, you know, uh, robots and spaceships of, of the Star Wars universe. And what all kids love. Exactly. And so when they saw this, they, uh, they jumped right on it. I think I got a little bit lucky just with submitting it to only 10. Only 10. And yeah. getting my chance. And it went out there in published form. This was the first issue, and it kept going kind of on a monthly and then a bi-monthly basis. We actually did 53 issues altogether of the entire series. And all this started from you creating it on your own. Exactly. In Japan. Exactly. And that's what I tell people. It's a two-part process. You need to do something. You've got to make a publishable book and then you got to show it around to people. Sure. Right? Now a lot of people forget that first step and all they've got is beautiful sketches and illustrations and they've got, you know, they're showing their skills but they have not created a story with a beginning, a middle and an end mm -hmm. and shown them here. Here's the complete package. This thing is ready to go and be put into the stores or whatever. In my case, that was the key, was having that thing that I could show people. So, people. so Mark, tell us how did the whole Mickey Falls saga begin? Yeah, well, that was an exciting thing. You know, I'm always trying to challenge myself to do new stuff. And with Miki Falls, um, I had never done something that was in the manga style before. Now, you know, I lived in Japan. Uh, my wife uh, is Japanese, and so my life has definitely uh, become intertwined with Japan. But I had never really tried to adopt the Japanese style in comic book form. So this whole project came out of me wanting to take on that challenge and learn that new skill of how to draw in the manga style. Um, I had the idea for the story um, before I, I decided to have it set in Japan. 
In fact, the story uh, predated it by a year or two, but I just, something was not motivating me enough to really jump into that story until I got the idea, oh hey, let's have it take place in Japan. Let's have all the characters be Japanese. And then suddenly, I don't know how if it is the same with you, but when I have a challenge like that, then I get the fire, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta, sure. I'm gonna have to learn all these new skills, and that makes it more fun and exciting. So that's kind of how that happened. It's like a dare. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You never want to, you never want to get uh, too much in a rut where you're too comfortable doing the same thing again and again. You know, you, you'll never grow. Exactly. So, Mark, can you tell us how you got Miki Falls published? You had the story in mind. It was set in Japan. How did you get it? in print. Right, well, you know, number one, I had a track record by that time. I had a Kiko, uh, it had come out, it had been a success as a comic book series, and so I had reached a level of success with that uh, product that I was able to get an agent at that time. And uh, my agent, her name uh, is Marilee Heifetz, she uh, encouraged me to pursue this project. She thought it had a lot of potential. And so this was the time where I had, I wasn't the one mailing it around. I had the agent who had the Rolodex and had the connections, you know what I mean? And so she was able to show it. And it was a very exciting time in my life because she, she handpicked eight different publishers that she thought would be interested in this thing. Okay. Five of them wanted to publish it. So it was like, whoa, bidding war, you know? I mean, this is the kind of thing everybody dreams about. Yeah. Uh, and it, the, these things came together at just the right time. I think the story concept, the, the manga style, it's a lot of people were interested in, in moving into that pl place. And I just happened to have the idea at just the right time. Right time. I first got published in a smaller way by a smaller um, publishing company. Uh, and I didn't need an agent to get in the door there. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's my advice to people who are trying to start out. No, you're not going to get published by Random House or HarperCollins or Scholastic right off from the beginning. You're, or if it's comics, you're not going to go straight to DC or Marvel mm -hmm. at the very start. You need to start small, then you put something out there, you build some rec recognition, you get a reputation, and then you can get an agent maybe. Okay. And then the agent can take you to that higher level. The truth is, if you have come up with a good idea, if you have the skills, mm -hmm. I would say that you you can get to a pretty high level without an agent. And then once you get to that level, then you can see about yeah, trying to find representation. That but way. to but start, yeah. you don't need it. All right, guys, you heard it here. Mark Quilly said, you don't need an agent. So those of you who think you need an agent, you don't, okay? <laughs> not yet, not yet. So Mark, can you tell us, do you have any you know, favorite current artists today? Wow, well I'm a big fan of uh, Death Note. And if people see my new series, Brody's Ghost, you can definitely see a big influence there of the Death Note art style. Uh, and, um, you know, as far as anime goes, I've always been a big fan of Miyazaki's stuff. You know, these days people are always talking about the Spirited Away or Howl's Moving Castle. I'm kind of from a little earlier generation. I'm from the Totoro or the Kiki's Delivery Service, that era of his work. And that has always been a big influence. If you were a young artist starting starting out today in 2011 how would you make your you know a Kiko or Mickey Falls book what do you, what's your advice for Right. all the talent out there. Well, yeah, I think in the age of the internet, uh, young people have an opportunity to get their work out there uh, in a way that uh, I didn't back in the 90s when I started. So I'm like, you know, I was photocopying things and mailing it. I think these days you should get your work out there on the internet. You know, um, you could use DeviantArt, you could use any number of different sites. Uh, but if you want to do a comic book story, I would definitely try to build an audience on the web. Now, of course, it's going to start small, right? It's this huge ocean of stuff. But if what you're doing is quality, you will build an audience. And you can use Facebook, you can use Twitter to, to start pulling people in. And if, like I said, if it's good, people will talk. And you will get a grassroots thing going, good word of mouth. Uh, and you have to keep to a schedule. you got to get maybe two, three pages out every week. And they can count on it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You will keep this story going, okay. and they can they can depend on that. You know, I think that's what I would definitely do these days. Consistency, consistency, consistency. 
uh, and just don't allow yourself to be off in this little ivory tower, you know, doing the work. You got to get into uh, what I call like the big plaza of the internet, you know. Uh, like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and these places, that's where everyone's out there moving around and they have a chance to bump into you. Uh -huh. Now, if you build up your golden little website somewhere way off in the corner, right? <laughs> How's anyone going to see that? It may be beautiful. It may be, you know, you're really fighting against the stream to get people, hey, come over and look at my website. People are like, no, I don't know, man. I don't have time for that. See if you can make a splash in one of those big plazas, like I'm talking YouTube, yes. you know, DeviantArt and these places where there's already people there and then they can kind of bump into bump what into you're doing you know? then. yeah okay all right then so mark what current projects are you working on now well the big thing I'm on right now is Brody's ghost it's uh, my new series from Dark Horse there's gonna be six books in the series altogether the first two are already out and I'm just finishing my rough draft of book three I know a lot of people are anxious to find out <laughs> where is book three Mark <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm getting on that, and that should be out uh, early next year. But part of the reason that I had to slow down on book three is I was finishing up this How to Draw Manga book, which Please I'm very excited tell about. Us yeah, more. very exciting. It's called Mastering Manga with Mark Crilly. It's being published by a company called Impact. Okay. It's a big, thick book. It's uh, in a way, it's sort of exciting for me because all my work has always been black and white until now. This is going to be a big, full-color book. You know, one of these instructional books, uh, and I'm thinking it's at least like. 130, 140 pages long. 40 pages thin. Yeah, it covers a lot of territory. Uh, people who've seen my YouTube videos, they know that I did the 100 ways to draw manga eyes. Big video. This book is going to have 101 ways. <laughs> <laughs> Had to kick it up a notch. 101 <laughs> ways to draw my guys. And it got a lot of things. Like, in, in, in all honesty, I think I will use this book myself sometimes <laughs> because I did a section on how to draw hands. I showed 50 different ways to draw a hand. Wow. It's like a pose book of different, you know, what the hand looks like. I, I swear, I'm probably going to pull it out myself <laughs> when I'm working. It's, yeah, it's like, well, what does it look like when right. someone's holding something? You know, I can learn from myself. <laughs> okay, that works. Well, you know, you know, give yourself a little crush so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Exactly. So, But this book, yeah, and the, uh, there's a section on perspective. There's a section on clothing wrinkles. I know people are always, you know, hung up on that. Where do you put the wrinkles when you're drawing? Mm -hmm. So I try to cover a lot of stuff that uh, the, some of the other books don't get into so deeply. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to set this book apart from, you know, you know, the other how to draw manga books how on the market. Manga. For part two of the interview, click here.